Cheringham, Episode 8, Snowblind, written by Matthew Costello and Neil Richards, narrated by Neil Dudgeon. Chapter 1. A Lovely Night for a Walk Archie Fleming pushed at the branches in his way. What happened to the path I was on, he wondered. The night had been so nice. It had been nice, hadn't it? Maybe a bit chilly, but now so much colder. And it didn't seem like such a nice night at all. He looked down. Was that a path? He couldn't tell, not with all the broken branches and leaves underfoot. Paths were usually clearer than this, weren't they? All the people walking on them, going from... going from... Where did I come from, he wondered. Well, back there, somewhere. There were other people there, but though he could see their faces, their smiles, he couldn't remember any of their names. Maybe he should turn around, go back there. But then if this was a path... Maybe it led somewhere, or had to lead somewhere. A village, a place to get warm, a pub, yes, has to be a pub ahead, with a roaring fireplace. He thought of those words, roaring fireplace. He kept stepping forwards, a thin branch that he hadn't seen snapped back and slapped him in the face, and it stung. That's when he noticed that the trees, the path, the leaves on the ground had all turned white. It's snowing. He did something he remembered from long ago. Archie stuck out his tongue, letting the flakes land on it, first a few, then more, until he could see that this was no gentle snow, not just a couple of soft flakes landing on his dry, cracked tongue. No, this snow was heavy, coming down hard, and though his slippers protected his feet right at his exposed ankles, the snow landed and stuck. Already the snow had made the ground disappear. His thin robe did little now. That robe, a deep mix of dark red and blue stripes, also had snow sticking to it. Roaring fireplace. And a pint. Like a pint, I would. He'd stand by that fireplace and sip his pint, in his robe, his slippers, let all that snow melt away. As if it hadn't been snowing at all. Archie kept walking his whole body shaking with each step, driven by the idea that ahead, at the end of this now white trail, there was a village and a pub, and all he had to do, no matter how cold he felt, was keep on going the way he was going. He fell, hard, right onto his knees, his now untrustworthy knees, kneeling in the snow, his grey hair covered in the white stuff. Archie looked around. Where was the damn path? It looked like it could go to the right. That looked sort of like a path. He remained kneeling. Didn't want to get up until he knew where he was going. Or to the left. Right. There's a path, narrow, but yes, he could see it, the trees with their snow-covered limbs so close, trying to hide it. No. Straight ahead was the way. Of course, that was the path. Just need to keep going in the direction he was going. He looked around for something to grab to help pull himself to a standing position. A craggy bush nearby. Dried berries still on its branches. He grabbed at a twisted handful of the bush's branches and pulled, using it to get off one knee. He had the thought, what if I can't get up? What if I end up staying here? And that thought made Archie's gnarled hands grab as tight as he could, hold the branches fast as he struggled to a standing position again. Then, as if rewarded for his great effort, he stood shivering, shaking, and he saw lights ahead. Two lights. There, 
and then gone. But then again, the village, the pub, close now, close. And Archie Fleming stumbled ahead, letting branches swipe at his face, since he knew he had to go fast, not caring about the painful scratches. He was close to the village, and all he had to do was keep going straight. Chapter 2 The Blizzard Getting bad out there, Jack? Ellie said from behind the bar, looking at the pub's front windows to the snowstorm outside. Jack turned and looked at the near-empty pub. Where is everybody? Not used to big snowstorms, I guess. Everyone getting all cosy at home. Fancy another? No, it really is coming down. I'd better get back to the goose. Ellie looked at two old men sitting off in a corner. Think I'd better tell that lot over there to get going as well. Time to close up and head to my own fireplace. They said it's going to be a real blizzard. Jack turned back to her. Good idea. You know, all that snow outside reminds me of home. We get storms like this all the time. I've heard. So then you're used to it. Know when to get out the snow ploughs. Salt, right? Not sure how little Cheringham will fare. It'll be interesting. Jack pulled on a cloth cap and buttoned up his pea coat. He had worn his wellies so he'd have no problem walking through the slushy stuff. But driving, that could be a different story. Be safe, Ellie. You bet, she said as she stepped out from round the bar and started turning lights off, finally making the two, what would the locals call them, geezers, start moving. Hope they don't have far to go, Jack thought. As the line goes, taint a fit night out for man or beast. And as he quickly discovered, not a fit night for his sprite. Back in New York, he had driven a big SUV that had no trouble handling ice, snow, rain, whatever. And though he had put winter tyres on his small sports car, he knew it didn't have a lot of weight to get through the snowy roads. As he backed out of the plowman's car park, he could feel those tyres struggling with the snow. I think I was a bit too cavalier about this, Jack thought. Back in NYC, he actually liked it when a big storm came, brought out the best in the people, everyone pulling together. And the way snow could muffle the noisy city, covering it with a white blanket, now that was something to see. But even though he didn't have far to go to get to his boat, he could tell he'd have to take it nice and slow. One thing, there didn't seem to be anyone else on the road. No ploughs yet, everyone hunkering down at home. Cheringham blizzard. He looked forward to getting back to the Grey Goose and enjoying the storm from there. Jack crossed the river and came to the familiar fork where the main road turned left into a series of curves, although in this storm it didn't look familiar at all. On either side the hedges looked like a line of snowmen, the heavy wet snow sticking fast. He had tested the brakes, very easy with a few gentle pumps, no anti-locking brakes on this vintage item. The only way he could make them not lock was by taking it slow. He remembered an old rule delivered to him by his dad when he faced his first Brooklyn winter as driver. His father's brogue always more pronounced when he became excited about a subject. Now, Jack, if you ever begin to skid, you got to remember to turn into the skid, you understand? Into it, then slowly out of it. More than once he had forgotten those instructions and nearly sent his first car, a beat-up Ford Pinto, careening towards the sidewalk. Now he took the turn smoothly. Just a bit of a slip there, but he could see the tracks made by the few other cars that had passed by. The road was deserted now, though, and his windshield wipers, small, matching the car itself, struggled to keep the wet snow from building up on the windshield. OK, he said to himself, nearly home. He reminded himself about how a storm as beautiful and big as this one could, in a heartbeat, turn dangerous. Considering the state of things, he might end up holed up on the goose for a few days. No problem there. Got his martini ingredients, a few steaks in the freezer. Plenty of food for Riley. Be just fine, he said again, liking the way his voice made the silence inside and out less intimidating. He came to the curve where the fields to the right gave way to woods a notorious spot which caught many a driver unawares, even in the best weather. Into the curve, so slowly. 
when he saw someone, suddenly a ghost-like figure covered in the white snow, run out into the road, turning as the sprite's headlights caught him in mid-crossing, the figure frozen standing there, eyes wide, leaving Jack with no option other than to hit the brakes hard and turn the steering wheel. Chapter 3 Spin Out And just as his father might have predicted, the sprite began a crazy skid. Instead of turning to the right and slowing, the combination of that turn and the hitting of the brakes sent the small car spinning, a 360. Something Jack hadn't experienced in nearly 40 years. The car had no control. Jack gently pumped the brake, hoping to get it to slow, even as it twirled around once, then again. For all he knew, whoever the crazy person in the middle of the road was, was still there, and the car would go flying at him like a pinwheel. Jack's stomach tightened. He hated not being in control. And this was a lot like being helpless. But then he saw that on the second full circle spin, the sprite was now sliding to the left into the snowy hedges. Then there was a heavy bump as the tyres sank into a roadside rut. And that rut, catching the two left tyres, at least had the effect, jarring as it was, of stopping the car. The whole wild manoeuvre was in slow motion, so Jack hadn't been thrown forward, smashing into the windshield or the steering wheel. He looked right, trying to see the road, searching for the ghostly figure he had almost driven into. But the side window had a coating of snow blocking the view. He rolled down the window, letting that coating fall into the driver's seat, but at least he could now see the road. Deserted, as if there never had been a figure at all. Jack opened the door of the car and got out. Snow blew sideways, nasty stuff, as if trying to sneak its way into any crack in the protection offered by his coat. Easily six or seven inches on the ground already and still coming down thick. Hello? Jack yelled. Where was the guy who had been standing in the road? Jack hadn't gotten a good look at him, just a glance before his turning, breaking. Now he could see the snowy circle made by the spinning car, but there was no one there. Jack had one thankful thought. At least I didn't hit him. Because if he had hit the man, the body would be lying just in front of that circle on the road. But what was the guy doing here, running across the road? Hey! he yelled. The figure looked as if it had come from the woods ahead. Maybe he had gone back there. Jack started walking in that direction. Hey, you, you okay? He had competition from the wind now, whistling in his ears and probably doing a good job of muffling his yells. Hello? Where are you? No footpath into the woods. How'd the guy come through there, pushing his way past branches, bushes? More like he was lost. Deeper into the woods and Jack realised that the guy could have gone anywhere, any direction. He stopped did a slow turn. And outside of the whistle of the wind and the steady falling snow, he saw and heard nothing. Whoever it was, he thought, let's hope he ran back where he came from. He wouldn't last long out here, not in this. He sniffed the air, then pulled his jacket collar tight to try and stop the invading snow and walked back to the Sprite. Getting the car out of the rut wasn't easy. He had to make it rock back and forth, all the time hearing the exposed rocky dirt grind against the undercarriage of the car. Going to need some work after this. But then, with one final thrust forward, the sprite's left rear tyre got some traction and pushed the car out of the rut back onto the road. And as he drove the last few minutes to his boat, he kept thinking of the man who had appeared on the road and then vanished. He'd call Alan to alert him and any of the crews out tonight to keep a lookout. But hopefully the crazy guy was already back inside his home, wherever that might be, ready to sleep it off, safe and warm. He pulled the car in as close to the river as he could, guessing that he wouldn't be using it for a while. He could check for damage in the morning. Then he heard Riley barking inside. Maybe the dog could tell that something was up outside, the storm, the wind, the snow... Or maybe he just wanted a walk. Coming, boy, Jack called, hurrying from the car and up the ramp to the grey goose. Riley was standing by the door, tail wagging wildly as Jack opened it. Thought I was lost out there. Guess you might need a bit of a walk. 
Riley knew that word and responded with an affirmative.